Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy continues a study on the seven churches of Revelation. Someone has said that there are a number of different bones in the body of Christ. There's wish bones. They're the kind of people who live their lives in the haze of what might be, but they never affect what is. There's the jaw bones who talk about what needs to be done by other people. There's the knuckle bones who just knock everything. But there's the backbones who carry on the brunt of the work. Remember when you first became a follower of Christ and the passion you felt toward the Lord? Remember those early moments of discovery as you encountered His endless love for the first time? Well, today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy makes his way through a study on the seven letters from Jesus to the churches. We're learning all about how the believers at Ephesus lost that love and feeling. You can catch up on previous messages online at ktt.org. But right now in Revelation chapter 2, here is Pastor Philip. I want us to look at, first of all, Christ's comprehension. Christ's comprehension. This is where the letter begins. It begins with the, a recycling of a portion of the portrait that we find in chapter 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands we are being reminded of exactly who it is that's walking the aisles of these churches. And so while this church has got its own angel, its own messenger, its own pastor, walking amidst the lampstands is the chief shepherd himself. It says he holds the seven stars in his right hand. I think that's simply conveying that he indeed seeks to protect those uh, under his charge and over the charge of his church. It's a message of reassurance, signaling Christ's strong protection over his people. In John 10, verse 29, we're told that when we by faith trust him, we are placed into his hand, and no one will pluck us out of his hand. And so this image is one of security and protection. And the church and its leaders here are in the grip of his grace and in the grip of his government. He is said to walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And this may be the image of the Old Testament priest whose job it was, was to go about the tabernacle or the temple and to um, remove the wick and the old oil and refill the lamps uh, with fresh oil and relight them before they, they go out so that the place of God's service and the testimony of God's Word continues unabated. And we have this beautiful picture of Christ carrying on this priestly ministry among his churches, tending to them, watching over them. And it's a beautiful image, too, of the church, isn't it? That the church is a lampstand. The church is to be light to the world. We're not to be indistinct in our living so that we present some kind of moral twilight. You and I are to live distinctly and Christianly, and we're to be light in the way we run our businesses in our viewing habits in the way we act and react towards others. It's our job to share the gospel with people in word and in deed. Some years ago, June and I and the girls had gone out into the Sandusky area of Ohio, and we went to visit the Marblehead Lighthouse, which lies between Toledo and Cleveland. And it serves the great ships that seal the treacherous waters of the Great Lakes, especially around wintertime. It was built in 1815, and since then it's been manned by 15 different lighthouse keepers. Today it's automated, and it's under the control of the United States Coast Guard. But what was striking about that whole adventure and encounter was as we stood outside that lighthouse, they had a list of all the names of those 15 lighthouse keepers. But what struck me, and that's why I wrote it down to use as an illustration someday, was above all those names were simply these words, the keepers of the light. And I remember for a moment just 
standing at this lighthouse and overlooking the great lake Erie. You know, that's what God has called us to be keepers of the light. And here Christ is amidst the candlesticks, trimming their lamp, wanting to fill them with new oil so that they might burn more brightly. And the point coming back to it is that Christ is constantly inspecting a church's creeds and a church's deeds. That's the point here. This is Christ's comprehension. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your work. Why would he know their work? Why would he know their labor? Because he stands and walks amidst the lampstands. He's intimately aware, he's intensely interested in a church's behavior and a church's belief. That's why almost every one of these letters begins with the ominous words, I know your works. You can read the letters for yourself. Christ is a kind of divine quality control inspector. He's looking at what we're doing. He's weighing it up. The Psalm Storm says, There's no sermon preached that he does not evaluate. No sin committed he does not be aware of. No individual enters an auditorium of whom he fails to take notice. No tear is shed that escapes his eye. No pain is felt that his heart does not share. No decision is made that he does not judge. No song is sung that he does not hear. And that's that's challenging and convicting. What a sobering thought. And I'm spending a little time here because we'll not spend as much time as we work through the other letters. Christ's comprehension of this church and all these churches. It's a sobering thought. And it challenges us to think more about what God is thinking. I know your works and I know your patience. I know you inside and out. We need to think more about what God is thinking because we live under the piercing gaze of Christ. We must not fall foul of the illusion that there's such a thing as secrecy or privacy. Sin is often strengthened by the illusion of secrecy. We think we can get away with something. We think behind a closed door with the curtains closed or away beyond the um, boundaries of, of personal accountability. We can get away with something. We can do something, but that's an illusion. I know your works. I know your labor and your patience. Whatever we do, whether good or bad, we do with God's full knowledge. You know, in Proverbs 15, verse 3, what do we read? That the eyes of the Lord go through the earth, taking account of of all that is happening. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. This is what we call what? The doctrine of omniscience. That God knows everything about everything and about everybody. He knows the future no less than the past and the present, says Packer, and possible events that have never happened no less the actual events that do. This is the one who walks among the churches. This is the one who sees our works, listens to our songs, evaluates our sermons, and checks our decisions. The church I grew up in, Rothkill Baptist Church, I had the privilege of preaching there a number of times while I was part of that congregation and since leaving it. And in the pastor's office in Rothkill Baptist Church, there hangs a text. It's from Genesis 16, verse 13. Thou, God, seest me. It's the words of Hagar, as God tells her to fear not. And I think it's there as a reminder to every preacher who's about to leave that office that they're not just going out to stand before a congregation of people but they're actually standing before an audience of one. Thou, God, seest me. Therefore, the pulpit is not a place for pretense and it is not a place for pantomime. You stand before the living God who sees through you. 
That's Christ's comprehension. What about, secondly, Christ's commendation? Just for a few minutes, Christ's commendation. Christ is swimming in knowledge of this church's life and labor, and it spills over into his commendation. There's things Christ likes about this church before he gets to verse 4 and the things that peeve him. He tells them, look, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you've persevered and you've labored in my name and have not become weary. And then in verse 6, and this you have, this is in your favor that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's much to commend this church. They are exemplary in a number of areas. Let's begin to look at a couple of those. I want you to see their dynamism, their durability, and their discernment. Look at their dynamism, verse 2. Christ knows their works and their labor. This church was an anthill of activity. They were winning the lost. They were visiting the widow. They were feeding the poor around the clock. This was a church busy in the service of men, and this was a church busy in the service of God. In fact, this second word, labor, is a word, copus, and it carries the idea of, of um, laboring to the point of exhaustion. They just didn't do a little bit. This was wholehearted effort and endeavor. In fact, this word is used in Luke 18, verse 5, of the widow who bugs the judge and bothers the judge and badgers the judge until the judge gives her justice. So this speaks of resolve and diligence. And, and you and I can read into this Christ's commendation of their exhausting and exacting ministry for the kingdom's sake. No loafers in the church at Ephesus. I think they would agree with the words of George Whitfield, the great evangelist of the 18th century who was once noted to have said, I get tired in the work but never tired of the work. That's the church at Ephesus. Someone has said that there are a number of different bones in the body of Christ. There's wish bones. They're the kind of people who live their lives in the haze of what might be, but they never affect what is. There's the jaw bones who talk about what needs to be done by other people. There's the knuckle bones who just knock everything, never to their pleasing. But there's the back bones who carry on the brunt of the work. And in this body of Christ at Ephesus, there were a lot of back bones, not a lot of wish bones, jaw bones, or knuckle bones. I know your labor. I know your works. Secondly, and this is where we'll stop, you see their durability? He commends them for their patience. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. Look at verse 3, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is a very attractive church. There's things you can command about this church. They're resolute, they're resilient, they're rock solid in their commitments. They weren't easily swayed. They certainly weren't easily discouraged. And you've got to gain to understand the background. Here they are amidst this bustling city where they were often boycotted in terms of commerce because of their Christian faith. They were often badgered and bullied. And just like some of the other churches in Asia, some of them lived under the threat of death. But here they are, not growing weary, persevering. In fact, this word patience in verse 2 is a word that means to, to hold up steadfastly under stress. And Christ commands them for that. And by the way, that's not simply human grit. It's not like, you know what? They hunkered down, they dug deep. This isn't some form of the brave, stiff British upper lip syndrome. This isn't worldly stoicism like you grit your teeth and you just pile your way through the problem. Now, what do we read in verse 9 of chapter 1? I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. They're patient because of Jesus Christ and his example, he himself endured, didn't he, according to Hebrews chapter 2? 
And they were patient not only because of his example, but they were patient through his strength. It could very well mean that they were indeed um, able to stand through the patience or the endurance or the strength that Christ gives his people. They could do the things that God had called them to do because Christ was pouring his strength in them. So please don't see this as some human expression of what we here in America call grit. It's more than that. This is divine in origin. These people survived because Christ was living out through them and his strength was being poured into them. And when you and I find ourselves exhausted, it's because we're, we're, we're kind of drawing strength from ourselves rather than leaning on Christ. And I also think they endured because they also lived in the light of his return and his reward. What do we read in Revelation 22, 12? Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And again and again, even at the end of this chapter, you'll see, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God, the garden of God, heaven. They persevered through the strength that Christ gave, and they found strength in, in the incentive of knowing that if they endured, they would win the crown. They would hear his well done. They kept going because they knew he was coming and it would be worth it all when they see Jesus. They expressed a present gallantry in the light of a future glory. And you and I always must be living with the end in view. But, but this quality is, is challenging and it's, it's encouraging Determination and perseverance is in short supply today, isn't it? We like it easy, and we like it quick. We've been weaned on that. And so convenience is the name of the game in America. But that won't do for your Christian life. If we're going to make a commitment, it'll be short-term rather than long-term. We have little enthusiasm for anything that takes a long time to acquire, or to achieve. But Christianity is a matter of long obedience in the same direction, against prevailing winds, against the world in rebellion to God, against the, the dead weight of our own flesh. <laughs> David Roper says, real Christianity means giving ourselves to everyday low-profile obedience, an activity for which we get the least encouragement, other people initially have more flash. They are euphoric whirlwinds of activity as long as things go well, but then they encounter pain and resistance and they fold. They are sensual people governed by feelings rather than by the word. Are we governed by feelings or by the word? Do we find enthusiasm in the example of Christ? Do we find strength in the power that he's willing to give us through the indwelling spirit? Do we find a reason to take the next step because we know that heaven's just around the corner? Closing illustration. Leroy Satchel Page. Anybody remember him? One of the greatest, most famous baseball players ever. He was the first black player to pitch in the World Series. He was the first player from the old Negro League to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was a legend. It is said that he won 2,100 games, 60 in one season, 55 without giving up a hit. He was 42 years old when he joined the major leagues as a rookie. We don't know how old he was because his mother had written his birthday in a Bible that was burned but it is believed that in 1948, when he began his career in the major leagues, he was 42 when he threw his first pitch for the Cleveland Indians. And he went on to lead that team to an American League pennant. In fact, he retired. And then many years later, some dozen years later, after he had retired, the Kansas City Chiefs brought him back. And again, he pitched three shutouts in quick succession in those early days. But here's what's interesting beyond all of that. He was known for some of his statements, much like Yogi Berra. He once said, age is a question of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> he also asked the question, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? 
This is the one I like where we close. And he said this, you win a few, you lose a few, and some get rained out, but you got to dress for them all. And that's true of life. That's true of baseball. And that's true of ministry in our walk with God. You and I must dress for them all. Every day that God sends us, we've got to endure. We've got to hold on a little longer. We've got to make sure that our light is shining and our life is in order. We've got to be working on our love for Christ on a constant basis. And all of that can be very trying and all of that can be very tiring. But it will, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus, when we get to eat of the tree of life and walk in the garden of God. Jesus has got some things he likes about this church. He likes their dynamism and he likes their durability. Let's pray. As we've begun to turn the pages of these seven letters from the hand of John to the churches of Asia Minor, God, we believe we're reading our own lives. We can identify with the problems. We can see ourselves in them. Oh God, as we look around us, we see our culture becoming more pagan and godless and post-Christian. And we mourn that and we pray, oh God, that if it would be your mind and will, that you might send the winds of revival and reformation sweeping across our nation yet again. Help us to get on our knees and pray. Help us to stand on our feet and speak up. Yet at the same time, oh God, we realize that your church can survive anywhere and at any time. And the greatest danger, the greatest threat to a kindred community church is us being prayerless and worldly and lacking in love for Christ. The danger is on the inside. Christ can take care of that which is on the outside. Oh God, you're wanting responses. You're wanting repentance. You're wanting renewal. And oh God, may we be marked by dynamism and durability. Make us busy and make us enduring and persevering as a congregation. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Living with the end in view is not always easy, but it certainly helps us get through tough times when we remember that we know the end of the story. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, and you can replay today's message online at ktt.org. Over the next several weeks, Know the Truth will be broadcasting these urgent messages from Jesus in the book of Revelation to as many listeners as possible. Jesus wrote the letters to the churches for our benefit, and with your help, the life-saving truths they contain will reach the ears of listeners all over the country and world. As a listener-supported ministry, it's your financial generosity that allows us to share the gospel on the radio and internet. So, would you join hands with us today? Your donation of any amount will be a life changer for so many. Call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. You can also send a letter, write Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. When you give, you'll receive a helpful book that will inspire you to shape your world for Jesus in practical and doable ways. It's titled, Authentic Influencer, The Barnabas Way of Shaping Lives for Jesus. Request your copy by calling 888-644-8811 or by giving online at ktt.org. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us again tomorrow when Philip DeCourcy begins the second part of today's message titled, Lost That Love and Feeling. That's Tuesday here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.